get things adjusted here. Uh, welcome to my shack. As you see, uh, my uh, work table in the background, uh, my radios are over to the side here. I, I can't really show those uh, without moving the camera, but uh, uh, this is this is my combination shack, office, um, operating position, and second workbench as well. So, <laughs> and good morning. I'm I'm uh, located just outside Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my call is WB4QDX, as uh, you'll see uh, in my title slide. I'm going to bring that up. Um, and I've been um, uh, active in uh, DSTAR uh, since about 2008. Um, I'll call myself one of the early uh, adopters of DSTAR. Um, it uh, really uh, got my interest back. I, I have been doing, um, well, I've been licensed since uh, 1969, uh, just to give you a little uh, ancient history. Uh, was licensed while I was in um, high school and uh, was able to get my uh, general and then my advanced class FCC license and then went off to college. Uh, couldn't do a lot of uh, amateur radio at that point except for mobile operation, VHF, UHF, VHF primarily at that point. Uh, I moved to, and I grew up by the way in uh, the middle Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee area. Uh, we moved uh, to the Atlanta area in 1981. Uh, I've been involved with uh, repeaters, uh, VHF and then UHF repeaters for uh, a good part of my uh, amateur life. Uh, got back into HF after 9-11. Uh, uh, got back interested in uh, uh, some additional work on HF and started exploring that again. Uh, around 2008, I got into uh, D-Star. I was introduced to it uh, by a friend uh, who he and I both uh, have become very active in it. Uh, I will say I've, uh, I'm also a, a fan and uh, enthusiast of all the digital voice modes, which I'll talk about in the presentation. Um, but uh, D-Star is probably the one I spend the most time with uh, and have uh, uh, talked with a lot of groups about them and, and very active. Uh, one of the reasons uh, I, I kind of got involved in uh, D-Star in a bigger way in our, our state, Georgia, uh, I made a presentation uh, back in 2009, I believe it was, to the Georgia Emergency Management Agency. They had heard a little bit about it from uh, our friends over in uh, neighboring Alabama who had uh, uh, purchased 12, I think, of brand new D-Star repeaters uh, from ICOM when uh, they were first being introduced. Uh, Georgia Emergency Management Agency had heard about uh, D-Star and asked for a presentation. Somehow I got nominated to do that. Uh, we had access at that point uh, in kind of the early days to several of our Georgia public broadcasting towers, which are located all around the state. And at that time, the uh, person who is who was vice president of engineering was also an amateur radio licensee uh, asked during their conversion to digital television, if uh, uh, we could locate uh, and what would we want to locate on the towers around the state. So in talking with uh, GEMA at the state level, they said, what do you need to take this uh, uh, very widespread over the state of Georgia? And uh, naturally the answer is money. So over the next year, we worked with them and were able to secure a grant uh, from GEMA, from FEMA funds, of about $250,000, of which we purchased several uh, full D-Star repeater stacks, which I'll explain what that is, um, and then also a uh, seed stock of radios, which were distributed to a lot of the emergency management agencies around the state. Uh, here we are much later in that process, and we probably have about, uh, I'm going to say between 45 and 50 D-Star repeaters around the state that we were able to deploy. And I'll share with you uh, one of the reasons that we chose D-Star as I get into this. So if we're ready, um, everyone, I'll uh, launch into my presentation. All right. Hopefully, I would say I'll give you a yes. Uh, we're 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 ready, John. Okay. 
And hopefully you're now, are you now seeing uh, my screen? Yes, we are. Okay, very good. All right, well, uh, again, uh, John Davis, uh, WB4QDX is my call. And uh, I am located uh, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia in the Southeast US. And uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of DSAR activity around. We also formed the, uh, the group, which we call Georgia DSTAR, uh, with our peach with the antenna tower on it, uh, as a way to uh, kind of offer and support a lot of the DSTAR repeaters around the state, uh, offer training and programs and uh, uh, other activities uh, to kind of support uh, the DSTAR repeaters around the state. And that is a mix of both uh, uh, funded ones, which we receive through our Georgia Emergency Management Agency grant, and uh, a bunch of private repeaters as well. So there's been uh, uh, a lot of growth in the state, and uh, DSTAR is a very popular mode here in Georgia, and I will say across the southeast. Before I uh, get into DSTAR in, in much detail, I would like to spend just a few moments talking about the differences between digital and analog radio. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with analog, our standard FM, which we see on VHF and UHF very, very prominently and have been for several decades. And we know as the signal level decreases, as shown by the green line on the graph, uh, you start hearing noise, uh, other things popping in, you're less than full quieting, as we say, and that degrades as the signal, uh, signal strength also degrades down to a point where the noise pretty much overtakes the signal. And that's indicated by the threshold line uh, near the bottom of the screen. Now digital uh, acts much differently and it takes a little bit of getting used to sometimes to understand the differences. But uh, because you are transmitting uh, ones and zeros basically, the audio quality stays pretty much the same even as the signal strength degrades down to a point where it cannot fully reproduce and, um, and give you back the analog uh, voice component. And that generally is down to a point where if you were listening on analog, it would be uh, pretty noisy. Um, but what happens, you've got this kind of no man's land where you have the sharp curve uh, that shows where a digital drops off and uh, you'll start to hear a little bit of warbling or uh, breaking up of the audio. And that generally means that um, you're getting down to the point where it cannot reconstruct the voice. But if you had been listening on a comparable analog radio, FM, at the same point, then the signal would be almost unreadable. Now, different digital technologies handle that sharp curve at the end, that drop off differently. And one of the things I will say is in D-Star, uh, it was chosen with the chipset that is in the radio that even though it may not fully uh, produce, reproduce the audio signal back, reconstruct it uh, from the noise, the added noise component and the higher bit error rate as we call it, um, you will get uh, what we like to call in D-Star R2-D2. And uh, for those of us that are fans of Star Wars, we know what that sounds like, and, and it's a very similar sound. Now, other uh, digital technologies may not allow that kind of no man's land and may just cut off the signal. And that's uh, generally one of the things that uh, a lot of people get, uh, well, they're not used to and have to adjust because your signal is generally there or it's not there. So with that, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of getting used to. All right, now let's talk a little bit about um, the digital signal in general. Now we are talking with voice, which is analog, and it's converted to data. So what is actually being transmitted on, on a digital radio is actually a data stream of ones and zeros in different formats. Now data itself, like keyboard data or file data or GPS position data, may be added to the voice to produce a single data stream, and that contains both voice and data. 
and that way you can transmit voice and data simultaneously. Now the radio is modulated uh, just like you would if it was totally a digital radio uh, or a data radio and what is actually being transmitted over the air uh, is a bit stream. Now what does that sound like on an FM radio? Uh, it, uh, it will sound like kind of a hiss or a buzz if you are monitoring that. So if you hear, if you're tuned on an FM radio, standard FM radio, and listening to a, uh, a digital signal, whether it be DSTAR, DMR, System Fusion, any of those, um, you uh, will hear that as kind of a hiss or a buzz, sound very strange. You may think it's, uh, you're receiving noise of some kind, but that is actually the carrier. I see a question, uh, does DSTAR have the ability to add some extra redundancy error correction for marginal conditions? On the voice side, yes, very much so. Uh, there is um, um, additional bits that are added in to actually help at the higher bit rates to reconstruct the data, which allows it to operate at lower signal level conditions. Very good question. Now, another thing we'll talk about on uh, uh, in terms of a digital versus analog signal, the occupied bandwidth. Uh, with standard FM repeaters, we think in terms of we're transmitting five kilohertz uh, modulation bandwidth. Well, that's actually plus or minus five. And if you look at the actual spectrum that a standard five kilohertz FM signal occupies, it's as much as about 16 kilohertz wide on the band. And that's because in, in, in FM, it's two times the mod, highest modulating frequency plus two times the bandwidth. So five kilohertz plus 10, you're modulating up to about three kilohertz. So two times that, 10 plus six, 16 kilohertz. And that is the actual emission designator for a standard FM signal. Now, let's compare that to digital. Digital is, uh, doesn't have a lot of high modulating audio frequencies, and it is occupying a much narrower spectrum. DSAR, for example, if you look at the emission designator for it, it is actually 6.25 kilohertz. Now, different digital modes, uh, such as DMR, System Fusion, etc., may occupy a little bit more or less, but they are typically much less than a standard FM signal. Now, that will help out in terms of adjacent channel interference uh, for, for repeaters. It uh, may also allow us to put more uh, repeaters, uh, more signals within a band because they are a narrower signal. So that's a general rule that digital voice and data occupies less spectrum than analog FM for the amateur radio uh, modes that we're talking about. All right, let's talk specifically about DSTAR. Um, in the early days of DSTAR, it was thought that it was a proprietary standard, but in fact, that is not the case. It is an open standard for digital voice and data designed specifically for amateur radio. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, one of the features of DSTAR, uh, as opposed to some of the other digital modes, is that your call sign is actually transmitted along with it. And I'll talk about the differences and why that makes a difference uh, in a little bit a little bit later in some of the slides. Uh, D-Star radios are available from ICOM and Kenwood. For years, ICOM was the only company that adopted the uh, uh, D-Star standard, uh, but uh, Kenwood, a few years ago, offered the, uh, the new radio, the uh, D-74, uh, which is an excellent radio as well, and uh, fully implemented the D-Star standard as well. Now, DSTAR is one of several digital modes that are used in amateur radio. Uh, among those are uh, System Fusion and DMR. Those are two of the most popular ones uh, in amateur radio, but you also have others, including NXDN, uh, which is a, uh, a standard jointly developed for commercial radios by ICOM and Kenwood. And then you have P25, which is the North American uh, digital standard for generally public safety applications. Now, there are several others uh, in, uh, in different parts of the world as well, but uh, the three uh, predominant ones that you will see are DSTAR, DMR, and System Fusion 
for most amateur radio operation. DMR uh, is a European standard similar to P25, uh, but it was uh, adopted uh, for, again, trunk radio system, public safety radio systems, et cetera, land mobile radio, and has been brought into amateur use um, as a, a very robust standard for uh, digital voice in amateur radio. System Fusion is a standard developed by Yezu uh, and uh, has become very popular as well. Now, DSTAR was developed by the Japan Amateur Radio League, which uh, the best way I, I, I relate to the JARL, it's kind of a combination of the ARL and the FCC uh, in the US. So they're kind of a regulatory body, but also uh, have a lot of the characteristics of ARRL. But it was something that was developed by them as an open standard and is well documented. It uses the AMB vocoder chip, uh, and that's uh, from a family of chips from a company called DVSI. And most of the uh, digital standards that we have today for digital voice uh, use chip sets from the DVSI family of chips. And what's that is used for to convert uh, analog speech to data and vice versa, back and forth. So almost every uh, one of the digital radios has a vocoder chip, which is a voice coder, which in a sense acts as a modem, uh, but it moves uh, voice to data and then data back to recreate the voice. Looking at uh, specifically what DSTAR can do, uh, again, we alluded that you can transmit and receive voice and 1200 baud data, similar to packet speed, uh, simultaneously on 2 meter, 440, and even the 1.2 gigahertz band. Uh, now, you don't need a TNC to do the data part because every radio has a, a serial data port uh, on the radio itself. Your call sign is sent with each transmission, and this is something I always point out to people. Uh, if you are a <clears throat> serial kerchunker, as I say, on uh, repeaters, uh, your days of uh, being anonymous are probably numbered because when you key a D-Star radio, the call sign is displayed on all, all radios receiving the signal. Now, we do have a higher speed data mode that is available on 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, it's called DD mode, digital data. And uh, with uh, many of the repeaters that have connectivity on the 1.2 gigahertz data receivers to the internet, uh, it can act as a bridge to the internet with a little bit higher. Now, we don't think of 128 kilobits as being very fast in today's uh, world of smartphones and uh, LTE and data in megabits and tens of megabits and et cetera, et cetera. But in the field, uh, if you need uh, connectivity, and this is configured as an IP uh, type of transmission, so it can act as an Ethernet bridge to the internet, or it could act a point-to-point -point Ethernet bridge between two radios capable of doing the DD mode on 1.2 gigahertz. Now, there's another feature in DSTAR called DPRS, very similar to APRS, and it is an automatic position reporting, but it is simultaneously transmitted with the voice uh, from GPS built into the radio. So it doesn't require a separate TNC uh, on, a, on a separate frequency as APRS does. So every time you transmit, it will actually have the capability of sending voice, or excuse me, your, your position along with that. And that can be decoded on the far end. It can be displayed on websites. Uh, it can actually be uh, displayed with uh, things like APRS.FI. Uh, by putting in. You will see, if you go to APRS.FI, you will see a combination of both uh, APRS and DPRS uh, positions reported there as well. Another function of DSTAR is to allow very flexible repeater linking uh, through its built-in, or not built-in, but a gateway PC, which is located at each repeater with an internet connection. So that allows you to link multiple repeaters together into what we call reflectors. And re 
reflectors are like a conference bridge. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about those as well. Now, something that has come on the scene over the last few years are hotspots. This began uh, early with a couple of products called a DV dongle and the DV access point, but that has really uh, grown uh, with several folks uh, developing hotspots and offering those. And what that allows is kind of like a, uh, a wireless router, but it allows your, uh, your local radio to access the DSTAR network through a hotspot. Uh, I have one that I will show you, and I, I have a slide that will talk about that a little bit more as well. Now, some features of D-Star radios, uh, most of them, and I think all of them, uh, have a built-in GPS uh, receiver that is used to know the current position uh, of your radio, but also that can be used to display the nearest repeater location. Uh, the current models uh, also include a, an internal database of repeaters. In fact, they, they come out of the box. You can get on the air immediately and find the turn on GPS and find the nearest repeater. Uh, they will have an SD card, and that is used for storing multiple memory files, different configurations. You can actually record QSOs, and then that's also used uh, for firmware upgrades. There is a serial data connector. Generally, that's just a three pin uh, connector on most of the radios, especially the handhelds, like this one shown, the ICOM ID51A, uh, it is a three pin uh, phone type connector with transmit data, receive data, and ground. On some of the uh, uh, mobile units and other ones, uh, the uh, Kenwood D74 has that as a USB connector as well. So uh, a variety, but you are able to send and receive data, you can get information out of the radio and also transmit the information as well. Uh, I think uh, one of the earlier presenters was talking about in Yezu, that's pretty much configured as a data out only. Now something that was introduced with some of the later models of the ICOM radios and then also carried into the Kenwood D74 when it came out was DR or digital repeater mode. And that allows a new user to get on the air took a lot of the complexity of the programming out of uh, or made it much easier. And that's shown here on this radio where you see uh, on the display, you have a to field TO and a from field. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that allows you to do. But in the short version, you select the repeater that you would like to transmit into on the from field. And then on the to field, you decide what you want to do. Do you want to link to a, re a reflector, you want to unlink, do you want to just talk? So that's selected there. So that, that with the built-in uh, database of repeaters, you're able to get on the air without really any additional programming that's required. And that makes that very easy to do. When operating D-Star, uh, I mentioned that uh, you do have a built-in database of radios. Now what comes with the radio um, is a, uh, I'll say it's probably a dated list because uh, whenever that radio was manufactured, it was loaded with a default repeater list. So it may not include all of the D-Star repeaters in every area, but that can be updated. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. You also have the function of being able to do the nearest repeater. And you can do the nearest FM or DV, D-Star function as well. Now, I failed to mention early on, uh, most of the, oh, I think all of the DSR radios, whether it be the ICOMs or Kenwood, uh, will operate both FM mode and DSTAR mode. Uh, additionally, on the Kenwood, you get APRS mode, which is nice as well, and um, as far as DSTAR goes. But you can update that repeater list, and that is done uh, actually very easily. And there is a site, which I will mention a little later on, point you to, which allows you to update that repeater list. Yes, you can program in a standard way of programming the frequency, offset, direction, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but with this, it makes the programming and the use of that very easy and very flexible. And from the uh, uh, front panel also, you can link to different repeaters or reflectors, and that is user selectable on the radio. So I'm not limited to only being able to link to the repeaters or reflectors 
that uh, the repeater or repeater owner has allowed me to do, but I can select any of them from the radio, and that is a, a nice feature of D-Star. And again, I said you have the 1200 baud data in all radios for position reporting, data transmission, or file transfer. Now, to get on the air, it's very easy. If you go to your local uh, radio store and uh, buy a D-Star radio, you can actually power up right then and get on. Uh, you can add, all you have to do is add your call sign to the radio, turn on the GPS function, select the nearest repeater, and you're on the air. Now, you may recognize this face uh, with uh, being Tim Allen uh, from the TV show Last Man Standing. Uh, Tim has one of the ICOM 51As, uh, and Tim is actually licensed, although he plays uh, a fictitious uh, call sign KA0XDT on the show. Tim is actually a licensed ham and was able to uh, uh, get a radio and get on the air. You may, not, uh, you may not catch him on very often, but that was fun. I had the opportunity uh, last year to go out uh, for one of the tapings of the show, Last Man Standing, and the uh, radio uh, shack that you see in the corner of his office is an actual operating station. And so we operated D-Star that night between their rehearsal and the actual taping of the show uh, with the radios there, and uh, we made about uh, 250 contacts in about an hour and a half uh, with stations all over, uh, uh, actually, North America. Um, <laughs> and it was a great, great time to do, and we actually got to stay then and see uh, a taping of the show afterwards. So it is easy to get on the air is the point. Now, some people will talk about registering your radio. Uh, let me point out, you do not have to register your call sign. But if you do, it does give you access to some additional features uh, for linking and unlinking uh, re to reflectors. Uh, and also, if you're using a hotspot, uh, you do have to register uh, to get on to the uh, series of what we call D plus reflectors. So you'll register your call sign. And um, it was originally started that uh, you registered on, um, recommended to register on your local repeater, the one nearest you. Uh, that worked out pretty well, but some uh, repeater administrators uh, are not real good about very promptly going in and approving call signs. And there is a process also that we want to make sure that that is a valid call sign. What you will want to do now, uh, a national site has been set up, actually an international site, I would say, uh, called Registration. Uh, and the, the link to it is shown up above. It's uh, regist.dstargateway, uh, it's actually .org. That's an error in my, uh, error in my uh, slide here. It is regist.dstargateway.org. And it's a, a process that you will go through to register your call sign. Unfortunately, it's a three-step process, but uh, everyone has tried to make that as painless as possible. The rule is you only need to register one and only one place, and that can be this regist site, uh, and you are registered worldwide because that registration database syncs with repeaters worldwide. Now, it is a three-step process. If you go to regist.gateway.org, you'll get this screen. You'll first uh, act as a new user, and you will put your call sign and email address. And when you do that, then there is a team of uh, administrators who will go in, will verify that your call sign is valid, that it is not registered at any other location, and approve it. Uh, I'm one of those system administrators. There's about five of us uh, around the world that will do that. Uh, and then you will receive an email back to the email address that you gave, instructing you how to add terminals. It's a very detailed, very simple process but you must complete all three steps to be fully registered. And that always generates some questions, uh, but uh, I'll mention a couple of things that usually come up on that. What if I change call signs? Well, you'll just go in and re-register as uh, your new call sign and go through the process again. Now remember, you put your call sign in the radio. That's programmed in the radio one time when you first get it, and that's the call sign that gets transmitted over the air and that's the call sign that gets validated for any of the uh, work through hotspots, et cetera. 
Now you notice one of my bullets here said uh, DMR ID. Now why would you need to do a DMR ID to operate DSTAR? Uh, many of the hotspots that are out there now uh, also want a DMR ID. Uh, many of the hotspots, um, in fact, most of them that are on the market right now will do multiple modes. They will do DSTAR, they'll do System Fusion, they'll do DMR, P25, ENXDN. But you probably will need to go ahead and register uh, for a DMR ID as well, because that's used in the setup of the hotspots. Even though you may not be using DMR or one of the other modes, uh, it's a good idea if you get one of the hotspots to go ahead and do that. Now, updating memories. Um, you can always have a list, of the latest list, of DSTAR radios. There's a site that a good friend of mine has uh, put together, uh, WA4YIH, uh, has put the site on called DSTARinfo.com, DSTARinfo.com. And although the radio comes preloaded with an international database of repeaters, that list can be dated and may not reflect all the repeaters in a specific area. So using uh, the download feature on dstarinfo.com, uh, it maintains a database, uh, although it may not be 100% perfect because it is user maintained, um, but it will give you, it's one of the best lists I think you'll find of all of the DSTAR repeaters out there. Now, not only does it uh, have a list of DSTAR repeaters to be able to update your radio with, you want to be able to update your FM repeaters as well. And dstarinfo.com was able to uh, share data uh, back and forth with uh, repeaterbook.com, which is an excellent source of repeater information. And also they share data with RT Systems uh, that has the programming software for DSTAR and many, many other radios. So if you go to dstarinfo.com, go to the downloads tab at the top, you'll enter your location, which is used to determine um, your location and we'll get all of the repeaters we can find for an area centered around your location. You'll select the, uh, the radio down below. It will tell you at that point how many memories you have to fill. Uh, you can reserve some empty slots, which I use for um, being able to uh, add hotspot programming in there as well. And then it will download uh, or give create a CSV file which can then be read into, imported into the radio to replace the repeater list and update it. Now, if you travel a lot, which uh, in recent years, I used to travel quite a bit all over the country. And so I would have different CSV files for centered around different areas of the country. For example, I'm in the Southeast, but if I was going out to the West Coast, I would have a repeater file centered around, let's say Los Angeles. And I would read that in and I would get the let's say 750 closest repeaters centered around that location and may have another one for Chicago or another one for any other area around. And that would let me quickly uh, get into an area, import that file from the SD card, and then I have a complete new memory list based around that area. So that became very, very convenient as well. I'm not seeing any questions uh, coming up on uh, the chat being relayed to me. But if you have any, feel free to ask along the way because we're really just kind of skimming the service to give you an introduction to DSTAR. That's a fantastic talk. Uh, yeah, no, no questions in the chat yet. Okay, thank you. Let's talk about reflectors. Reflectors are kind of like a conference bridge and they are used to link repeaters and hotspots together. Now, if you'd like to know where you can get a list of reflectors, uh, many of the D, D plus repeaters, uh, reflectors as we call them, listed as REF and then a number, uh, are uh, listed on the reflector page of dstarinfo.com. Now there are different types of reflectors, but all of them are compatible with, with DSTAR. There's the XRF uh, series of reflectors and other groups as well. So you can actually then link through your local repeater or your hotspot to one of these reflectors. And then once you're done there, then you will have uh, all of those repeaters. If you go in on one, you're coming out on all of them. It's truly a, a linked network. 
and the audio quality being a digital voice uh, is no different than if you're simplex next door or across the country or around the world. In Georgia, we were able to, as part of our funding, grant funding, we uh, received a, a very nice quality server and we created Reflector 30, REF030. And each reflector has, in a sense, like different modules. And they're like separate uh, conference bridges within the same reflector. So you might have an A, a B, or a C. And what we created is that all of the repeaters in Georgia are on reflector 30 Bravo, 30B. And that created a statewide network. Now, on each individual repeater, you can unlink and link somewhere else. And then after a period of idle time, after someone finishes their QSO with it, another area, it will relink back to Reflector 30 Bravo. So we maintain the statewide network, which has been used. Uh, we had some storms uh, going through the state last Sunday evening. And so we were able to take weather reports in from different parts of the state. Two of the most popular reflectors, uh, and if you get on D-Star and want to hear traffic, Reflector 1C, Reflector 1 Charlie, or Reflector 30 Charlie, 30C. Those are, you, you will find pretty much um, traffic on there 24 hours a day because people will be list, linked to it uh, from worldwide. Uh, you may have uh, 150, 200 repeaters at any one time and that many and more hotspots all connected at one time. So if you're looking for a QSO with someone, um, Reflector 1C or Reflector 30C are available. I left off a slide that I should have put in here. You can find uh, who is on a and who is connected to a repeater by, the, by going browsing to the link, uh, let's say REF 030c.dstargateway.org and that will show you a dashboard of who is connected both repeaters and hotspots to any reflector. So that usually generates some questions but I if you just uh, put the reflector or even the repeater call sign if you put uh, uh, the call sign .dstargateway.org it will show you who is connected and the last heard on uh, a local repeater as well. All right, we mentioned hotspots. What about hotspots? Uh, there's some nice little devices that have been created uh, either at the board level, which uh, in the top right you'll see the DV Mega Board, uh, a very nice board that has been created. It can be connected to a Raspberry Pi, uh, to a computer, uh, and that is basically your RF interface and you see it has an SMA uh, connector on for an antenna. If you put it into a case, um, it uh, makes a very nice little compact package just to apply power and uh, either an inter internet connection by Wi-Fi or uh, an ethernet port. You'll see also there's an RJ45 on the lower left side of that as well. Uh, does that work with wires or fusion? Uh, yes, most of these hotspots are multi-mode. They support uh, D-Star, DMR, Fusion, uh, NXDN, P25, uh, others. And I have used my, this, the one shown here is a, uh, uh, what's called a Zoom spot. Uh, it mates with, uh, it's a daughter board, uh, the, the daughter board on top of a Raspberry Pi W, the very small one and uh, makes for a nice compact package. I have one powered up over to the side over here, and I look over at it, and right now there's a conversation going on on P25. So if I pull out my P25 radio, uh, I can actually join that group as well. Um, the many versions of the hotspots are, um, there's a DV Mega, there's a Zoom Spot, there's a new one that just came out called the Open Spot 3. Uh, which offers some transcoding capability built in for linking cross mode. And that's one thing that you'll see as well. You can link across between two digital modes. And that makes it for very interesting work as well, uh, no matter what type of rate digital radio you may have. Now for programming on that, you can also use the DR mode in the D-Star radios. 
uh, in there as well. So uh, you'll notice on my, uh, the second line, uh, line 30, I program in the hotspot uh, and now it is available that I can select from my menu in the from mode of uh, that. And, and then I can use my uh, handheld or mobile radio, which I have here in the house uh, to connect to different reflectors, different repeaters, et cetera. So hotspots is something that have really grown. They're not very expensive. They're uh, anywhere from uh, around $100 up to uh, probably two or three hundred dollars for the different modes on those. Uh, but they're a very handy tool uh, for one, if you're traveling, if you're not within range of a D-Star or other digital mode repeater, uh, or if you just want it uh, as a convenient alternative and uh, not tie up your local repeater. So uh, hotspots, very good way to go with any of the digital modes and uh, was first designed for D-Star and now has been expanded because they have the, uh, the chipset in there to do the voice coding uh, as necessary. All right, don't see any more questions there. DD mode. We talked about this 128 kilobit mode uh, that's available on 1.2 gigahertz. Originally, ICOM came out with a radio. In fact, it was the first D-Star radio uh, produced fully for D-Star uh, called the ID-1 and it operated only on 1.2 gigahertz. It would do FM, it would do uh, uh, regular DV or digital voice mode, but also DD mode, uh, which was the higher de RS speed data. So you can use uh, the DD mode on 1.2 gigahertz to create a 128 kilobit IP based data stream. So that can be used if you have two radios, let's say, you need to bridge between two points. Um, it can actually act as a, an Ethernet bridge uh, because it is IP based through that. Or if a repeater is located or is equipped with uh, what's called an RP2D, which is a 1.2 gigahertz data module, then it can actually receive that and transmit or, and actually send it to the Internet or bridge to another radio as well through there, through a repeater. So it becomes a data repeater, truly a data repeater and a little higher speed uh, than might be normally available. Uh, it does have an RJ45 connector on it. Uh, two radios that were produced after the ID1 was the, uh, the 9100 from ICOM and most recently the 9700. Uh, and those have uh, 1.2 uh, data and they will do the higher speed DD mode as well. So those are the ones that will actually do that. We, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, something we did several years ago. We were uh, working with our local emergency management agency here in our county and uh, we were doing a simulation. We were out. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting. It was a time of extreme drought, but we were actually, we were out inspecting uh, like stream gauges and uh, dams uh, as if it were a, a flooding condition uh, that we were out uh, providing data uh, and damage reports on. So we ran into a situation in the lower right picture where we could not get to one of the bridges to read one of the stream gauges. And we told our local EMA director that uh, we could not get access to the bridge. There was a gate across it with a big stop sign. He said, well, let me look at my aerial data, which was updated every six months. He said, I don't see that across there. You must be at the wrong location. So via the D-Star radio, we first sent the location, the GPS location. He said, yes, you're at the right location. And then we actually sent this picture to show that the gate was across there and we could not access it. And he was very impressed that uh, we could actually get real-time data to him, including a picture uh, of what was happening, which was better uh, and more current data than the six-month updated data that he uh, receives with photographs all across the county. Now, we took that one step further and let's say, what if we put this in an airplane and took pictures from the air and that could give us uh, real-time or near real-time damage assessment. So we had uh, a local pilot. We equipped the aircraft with a, uh, a 1.2 gigahertz antenna. 
and you see the ID1 radio uh, off to the operator's uh, side. And we were actually taking digital pictures from the air, sending them back. We posted them and we used the uh, Google Picasa site to post our pictures along with the metadata, which showed the location where they were taken. And so we flew about 75 miles away from our area up to Athens, Georgia, took pictures and then uh, sent those back via the ID1. Now, remember, it's only 128 kilobit data speed, so you're not going to send extremely high resolution pictures, but uh, we could send a medium resolution picture uh, about every minute to two minutes and provided this series. And then using uh, Google uh, photos from other locations or at similar locations, we could show what is it, what was it when the picture was taken as a before, and then what was the real time look with a photo that was just taken and sent back by the aircraft. So this was kind of interesting, uh, an interesting use of it and uh, proved very useful for both uh, our local emergency management agency and the state uh, EMA as well. Uh, question, hearing traffic from connector repeaters, but the D-Star repeater replies you are and doesn't seem to be receiving. All right, part of that could be, um, well, several things actually could be. You uh, will typically see, if you unkey, you may hear just a little burst of noise and strolling across the bottom of the screen, it may say RPT question mark. And a lot of people question whether that is uh, correct or is something wrong. What is happening, the repeater is still transmitting your last packets and that your radio receives that in incomplete mode. And uh, therefore it, it says RPT question mark, meaning, well, I didn't get quite everything, but uh, I'm letting you know that. Now, if you have R U R doesn't seem to be receiving hearing traffic from connector repeaters. I'm not real, but the D-Star repeater replies, you are. Oh, okay. A lot of that may be, I think I see now. When you're actually transmitting, you, you provide what you want to do is actually in what's called the UR field that's being transmitted. And um, you may be setting up on your radio uh, to display that. Uh, if you're hearing traffic from the repeater, then, um, then you're okay and you can just change the display uh, to show what you receive, not the UR. Uh, but if it doesn't seem to be receiving, I'm not sure it's probably a programming error. I don't know what radio that you have um, to really choose from on that. Now, the second question is, uh, I just picked up a 7100. And when I connect in DR mode and key up CQ, CQ to local repeater, I only ever seem to hear all over and not get replies. Okay, a very, I, I know the answer to this, and this is a very, very common uh, thing that when a, someone first gets started. All right, you're in DR mode. If you uh, click or press on the two section there, another screen will come up and you'll have several choices there. CQ, CQ, CQ means that you are transmitting only to your local repeater and you're not instructing your repeater to send the packets out the gateway to hotspots or to the reflector. What you will need to do is change that from local repeater to use reflector. It'll see you say use reflector or use repeater. And then on your screen, when you select that, it'll come back and say, use reflector CQ, 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 or use repeater CQ, CQ, CQ. And what that means at that point, you're not only transmitting on your local repeater, but you're instructing your radio to send them out the gateway uh, so that you can hear, uh, so you can be heard on other repeaters. Uh, sometimes you may be monitoring a, uh, a reflector and you're only hearing one side of the conversation. And generally that's what happens. One person is on their local repeater, they have it in local CQ, which is CQ, 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 and they're not getting out of their repeater. So you can't hear it because you're listening through another repeater on the reflector. Very common issue, and unfortunately by default, uh, most radios come up in local CQ mode and you just need to change that. Uh, congratulations, you're using DR mode, but with that minor change, 
I think you'll find uh, it'll be uh, much more useful to use. All right, I think I got those series of questions answered. Uh, I'm really kind of coming to the end of mine, which looks like I'm right about on time. I will offer these sources uh, for resources to, uh, to get other information, dstarinfo.com. Not only does it have the uh, repeater and net list, memory downloads, but a lot of good information. Uh, you'll also see a section there on DRATS, which I did not talk about. DRATS is a, uh, a program that connects to the data side of the radio or can actually uh, use it in telnet mode uh, to do uh, a lot of uh, data functions, file transfer, FTP type functions, uh, chat, email, etc. dstarusers.org. If you're new to DSTAR and you may be building a repeater, there's a lot of good information there. It also has a list of repeaters as well. Um, let me see, dstar.info. There's a lot of repeater utilities. If you have a DSTAR repeater, uh, this is a great resource for a lot of uh, information, but it's also a place to uh, find information on call sign registration. All right, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, I haven't seen any other questions. If you have any, uh, we can take this time to try to address those as well. None in the chat, uh, I guess, just I was kind of curious is the uh, the data transmission side, would that work in a uh, keyboard to keyboard type of mode if you put a terminal client on both sides hooked up to the serial port? Yes, it will, uh, because all you'll have to do is, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, uh, it would uh, it just need to be, you know, to, to, to the two IP addresses. You have an IP address on your end, the other one. Uh, and so, yes, you could use keyboard to keyboard chat. Oh, very neat. Uh, one from, I copied it from the, uh, I can just read it, I guess. Uh, question, does DSTAR support smart beaconing, uh, putting sub-audibles in there without annoying users on the repeater? I, I imagine that's for a mixed mode operation. If you have a FM receiver, um, you may not want to be opening the squelch from the digital transmissions. No, it, uh, it, it does it quite different. Uh, number one, it's not doing it in sub-audible mode. It's doing a, a part of the data stream. However, uh, you don't want to do the beaconing um, normally because when it um, wants to send that GPS position information, it's actually keying the repeater. Now, you, want, you don't want to set it for smart beaconing. You want it to beacon only, and it's not really beaconing. You want to set to send position information only on PTT. So every time you key, then it will send that data as part of the data stream, the position information along with it. So you don't want to enable beaconing because you'll hear the repeater keying up off and on every time that you try to uh, to beacon. Uh, DRETS refuses to install a Win64. Is there a workaround? Um, not sure because I'm using it on uh, Windows 64 right now, 64-bit. Now there is, if you'll go to dstarinfo.com and go to the DRETS tab, uh, there's another module that you, uh, another program, a, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of it right now, but it's, uh, uh, in fact, let me do this while I'm sharing my screen. Uh, let me bring up a browser. Um, let me bring up one over here. I can show you real quick. Uh, it may be, may be easier to do. Let me bring this over onto my screen. And go to dstarinfo.com. And if you go to the DRATS tab here, um, here is the, the file. And um, one of the things about DRATS I'll mention, unfortunately, the, the original developer of this has lost interest uh, in it, has not done any updates in it for several years. However, there is a gentleman in Italy who is starting to pick up uh, and has uh, updated a lot of the source code and is starting to work on some updates for that. Now, for the original question, this file here called LZHUF. If you're running, um, like the line says above it, DRATS was originally uh, set for 32-bit. If you're operating Win64, you installed a 64-bit version of this LZHUF underscore one dot exe in this folder. And you'll find that where you have installed uh, DRATS. And that will allow it to work. Uh, I think it works much better. Uh, now, if you're having a problem that it isn't installing, I'm not sure what the issue is. 
because it does install that you only have to change this LZHUF file for that to happen. I hope that answered your question. And you know, you might even check run run as administrator to see if your Windows is actually blocking you from trying to install it. Windows loves to do that to you, to overprotect you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, can you send an SMS text uh, email using DSTAR? I guess maybe that's um, sort of prompted by the uh, APRS presentation from earlier. Um, not exactly. You can, um, there's a way that you can set up DRATs. I'm trying to think of any other way that you could do it. You can set up DRATs to send out an email. And of course, if you know, um, you can send text to an email address, if you know, depending on the carrier, like uh, something.att.net or something like that. Um, but there's not a way to do it as an SMS text. Now there is a provision. Um, let me see. I want to stop sharing just a minute. Feature within DSTAR that you program and you can program it. You can program it from the front panel, but it's much easier to do with the programming software that um, allows you to send a short message. It's, uh, I'm, it's much shorter than your SMS message on a, on a smartphone, but you can put a message out there. Like for example, you could put uh, your location, your radio, your name, etc. And if you turn the message feature on, uh, when you transmit, it will transmit first your call sign and then slash and four characters that you can put in for a name or something else. And then you can uh, program the message to be, and I don't remember what the length of that is, but it's um, it may be 20 characters, something like that, that you can transmit along with it. And a lot of people will, and you can store different messages in the radio. So uh, like, for example, if I go to a ham fest, uh, if I was going to Dayton, I might put en route to uh, Dayton Hamvention and have that transmit while I'm en route. Um, and that would show up on everyone's radio that's receiving me. That's interesting. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, uh, I think that uh, you'll see some D-Star location information show up on uh, viewers like APRS-5. Was that correct? Yes. And also, let me show you this as well. Let me go to um, one of the, well, let me see. I need to share my screen again. I'm sorry. Is that like, is that a different network or does it actually feed into the APRS-SIS uh, network? Uh, it is, um, let me see, get back here. Okay, do you have my screen again? Yes, we do. All right, if I go to one of the repeaters that I mentioned, let's say ref030.dstargateway.org, this is the dashboard. All right, this will show me all the repeaters that are connected. And you'll see 30C has a long list, remote users, etc. Now, I want to find someone on this list. Well, I'm not seeing any of them that are transmitting GPS. Uh, let me go to a local repeater, uh, and I can do that by just putting in the call sign. Uh, let me pick one here. Um, uh, just trying to think of one that I can do uh, for DOC. Uh, well, none, none are doing it. Normally, if you see someone and their call sign in the last herd is bold orange, you can click on that and it will bring up a Google map and show their location. But that would be someone who is actually transmitting GPS as part of their position and their normal transmission. I wish okay, understood. Find. So that's published then by the, uh, by the local repeater then. Right, correct. So John, just one more thing. Um, you're typing the, the name of the repeater there, but I just wanted to point out you can get to that from the main um, repeater stage by just clicking on status beside any of the repeaters. You so can. You don't have to manually type it, but you're just, you're so used to it. It's a quick way to get there, right? You're, right. You're, you're a shortcut. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, I was trying to think of one that might show uh, another large area repeater um, that might show, have someone that was uh, transmitting GPS just to show how it is. But, but basically it's the same way that if you see them in bold orange down here, under last heard and click on them, then it would show on a Google, it'll bring up a Google map with their location. 
Okay, yeah, very good. I just wonder if it's similar because um, I have uh, connected into the APRS network and, and just pull in massive amounts of packets from it, uh, which you can do as uh, when, when you said you could view it with the DSTAR, I was wondering if there's a centralized network with that similar ability. It sounds like maybe not. Well, there's a module uh, to, to really think about how, um, uh, let me see the best way to explain this. The gateway of a DSTAR repeater is actually a Linux PC and it is running um, the, the gateway software. But you can also, there's a lot of third party uh, applications that have been built for it. One of them that loads with most DSTAR installations uh, actually acts as a, a gateway, like an eye gate for any traffic coming through it to, to gate it to the APRS IS network. So that's how that information gets out to the different sites. Okay, understood. So in, in uh, I guess in that vein, then the uh, question about sending the SMS text is you might be able to build a, you might have to build yourself a connector uh, that that's cool that will format uh, messages properly from a DSTAR network to get into the APRS by to the get to the SMS gate, um, you know, stacking the uh, boxes to get to the cookie jar on top of the fridge. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, I, I will let uh, also add, I'm going to give you one um, email address if you have questions uh, and want to send it to info at dstarinfo.com. Myself, uh, the admin for that site, and uh, maybe one or two other people are there to try to answer your questions. If, if we can't answer it, we'll try to at least uh, point you in the right direction so that uh, we can try to get an answer. So info at dstarinfo.com. We'll be glad to help you. Also, I'll mention there's a lot of good uh, uh, videos either on YouTube, um, the ICOM site. Uh, well, no, let me mention this one, uh, dstarinfo.com. If I go back to that, um, let me bring my screen up again. I'm, we're running close to time, I know. Um, if I go back to dstarinfo.com and look at the home page, and then there's also a tab here called conferences. And I did a class at Dayton about six years, almost six years in a row. I had to skip some. Um, at Dayton, it was a three hour class and we, we uh, posted the slides and some of them actually have the video from the conference um, that you can go back and stream at your convenience and, um, and get more DSTAR information. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of good information under the conferences tab. Presentations that uh, Ed, uh, the admin for this site, and I have done, and others, uh, Robin Cutshaw, who's one of the early developers in DSTAR AA4RC. Uh, we've done those over the years, and we've posted a lot of those presentations there. But this becomes really a, a very handy site uh, for a lot of good information, or will, will push you in uh, toward other information. A lot of things up here in the tab, repeater maps, the downloads, uh, nets, list of reflectors, etc. So it's a, it's a great resource for you. I guess that's about all. Well, that's perfect, John. Um, thank you very much for a great presentation and uh, thank you for joining in with us in, uh, in Canada and helping us do our uh, social distancing and not social isolating. <laughs> very good. Great. Hope to so, chat with some of you on the air.